But let's now have a look to some example of uh, fishery strategies. In particular, we're going to discuss what can we do if we want to maximize fishing output and what works in the long run to make it that sustainable. So we will introduce the concept of maximum sustainable yield. We'll look also how to maximize the economic return of fishing activity, either in the short run or in the long term. We look at how we can minimize extinction risk and minimize the variability in fishery performance. Let's start from the first one, constant quotas in total allowable catch, TAC fishery policies. Let's explore the effect of combining the goal to maximize the yield with a quota-based regulation. Basically, the dynamics of our uh, stock can be described by differential equations, dn over dt. And fn represent all the stock equipment function. Could be a logistic uh, form or anything else. And q is the quota, the cost and quota, that we want to remove from the population year after year. We've seen that we can represent graphically uh, this uh, system on a plane in which on the horizontal axis, we include the stock density that goes from zero to K, the current capacity. And uh, F of M, the red function here, represent the F on M that is here, the stock recruitment relationship or unit type. And here on the vertical axis, we can either bring the dynamics of the stock with its recruitment as represented by the red line here and the quota Q that we want to remove. So let's set up a quota that is much lower than the peak of the stock recruitment function. The function is there. So we can see that this horizontal line is constant quota represented in blue. Intersect the stock recruitment functions in two points. The first point is this one here. We see that here, <clears throat> if we exceed uh, this density in this point, the harvesting, the quota harvested at every time step is larger than the recruitment. That means that the population will tend to go back to the density that is represented at the intersection between the quota and the stock recruitment function. On the other hand, if we get a little perturbation and the stock reduces because below the level that is obtained at this intersection, then recruitment is larger than the quota and the population will tend to that point again. So this density here is a stable, uh, this equilibrium here is a stable equilibrium. We call this with density N plus. And the difference between recruitment and zero represent the catch, the quota, in fact, that is removed every year. Now, have a look to the other intersection point here. Okay. And what we see here is that if there is a little perturbation, so this is an equilibrium point, and if there is a little perturbation uh, from this equilibrium point to the right, the recruitment is larger than the quota that is harvested. So the population will tend to move towards the right towards N plus, in fact. On the other hand, if there is a little perturbation and the density drops below the level where the intersection occurs, then the harvesting, so the output, is larger than the recruitment. So dn over dt will be negative, and the population will keep decreasing going down to basically local extinction. So this equilibrium is an unstable equilibrium. Okay, It's an equilibrium, but small perturbation to the right will make the population to increase to N plus, and small perturbation to the left will lead the population to the local extinction. And we call this so as N minus. Uh, we can increase the quota, and we can see we're going to get a new equilibrium point, stable, and a new unstable equilibrium point. It's going to be a little bit to the left, the N plus, and a little bit to the right, the N minus. So you can see that the range between at the stable equilibrium and the unstable equilibrium start to decrease. And we can increase the quota even more and this range start to decrease even farther. Okay. If we want to maximize the harvesting that we can get uh, every year, we are going to go 
up here at this level. And this is an equilibrium point, and this would be the maximum yield. Uh, and what actually happened here is that if there is a little perturbation to the right, so the stock increases a little bit, the harvesting is going to be larger than the recruitment and the population will tend to decrease. So on this, you know, watching from this side, this equilibrium seems stable. On the other hand, if there is a little perturbation to the left, the harvesting is going to be larger than the recruitment the red function. And so the n over dt is going to be smaller than zero. And if the, the case, the population will continue to decrease down to local extinction. So this type of equilibrium is called a semi-stable equilibrium because it's stable when approached on one side, but it's stable when approached on the other side. It's actually oops, a very dangerous situation because if we try, if we use a policy with constant quotas and we try to maximize how much we can harvest, just the little vagaries of the weather from year to year might easily push the population below this density for which if we do not adjust the quota very quickly, we will drop down to local extinction, which is not good. Now, so this is clearly an explosive combination that inevitably leads to tragic outcomes. Local extinction of the stock, labor and harvest, you know, quota catch, all gone. Certainly something not desirable. And you might guess, you know, who's gonna use such a policies? But actually, this has been a policy used for whaling, okay, in which basically the different type of whales have been expressed uh, in terms of blue whale equivalent. Okay, so because a blue whale is so much larger <clears throat> uh, than the, a fin whale or a sperm whale, and so on, they can basically be measured in terms of blue whale equivalent, and so. One blue whale is equivalent to two fin whales, to two and a half amphicarc whales, and to six tail whales, and so on and so forth. Now, in the past, the blue whale unit uh, was used by an you know, international whaling commission, and catch quota were you know, set uh, by IWC, the International Whaling Commissions, and we can represent here the actual quota. So, for a few years, the system of the quota seems to work really well. A quota of about 16,000 you know, blue whale equivalent were set and roughly match every year after year. Okay, but that's something that happened. And if we go into the early 60s, a quota of 15,000 was set there and only 11,000 were caught. And uh, so they started to adjust the quota and bring it down to 10,000. That year, only 8,400 and something whales. You know, uh, BW we are um, caught, and then it was set to 4.5, you know, 4.5 thousands, and the catch was four, and then 3.5 and three, and then dropping down. So, really, what it looks like that the quota were kind of catching up with the actual catch and rather than regulating the catch. And so, the system clearly was not working. So the question now here is how to fix the inherent weakness of quota-based fishery regulation. For instance, one could think that we could change rather than setting up a quota and never change again, that we can change the quota year to year as a fraction of estimated fish stock. But there are a bunch of problems here, to which one of them actually is not even indicated on the slides here, that doing a good fish stock assessment is actually very hard. And stock assessment are affected by huge level of uncertainties. There are vagaries of the weather as we mentioned before. And therefore, it's difficult to understand where exactly the stock is. I think that Boris Worm said that counting fish is like, or whales in this case, of course, uh, it's like counting trees, except they move and they are hidden under water, so they might be difficult to spot them. In addition to that, it has been shown that using a total quota um, system does not prevent overcapitalization of the fishing fleet, which leads to what Ray Hilborn has referred to as an Olympic race to fish. So the idea is that I 
tend to increment the effort and the fishing effort, the size of my fishing boats or the number of boats in my fishing fleet as much as I can. Because at the beginning of the fishing season, I just need to go there and raise and fish every single fish or every single whale um, as fast as possible. Because any fish or whale left there a little bit longer will be fished by somebody else. And so I need to improve my fishing effort in order to try to fish as much as possible as soon as possible. There is a way to correct in this, which is called uh, individual transferable quotas, which work even better when they are connected with territorial user rights to fish. That provide the second one provide exclusive access, and the first one provide a way of uh, avoiding uh, this overcapitalization of the fleet because you can only fish so much, so there is not really a reason to exceed your. Um, you know, the power of your boat and the size, you know, of the boats, the fishing boats that you are above certain levels that, you know, once you will be able to um, you know, achieve your uh, individual transferable quotas. Of course, I mean, this system is not exempt for um, challenges, let's call it this way, because you need a very cohesive system with a regulatory body that is able especially to do two things at the very beginning, decide how these ITQs are going to be distributed among the fishermen, number one. Second, you need to enforce that each fisherman or fishing boat or fishing fleet will respect the ITQs that has been given. And third, an additional criticism that this really close the fishery to those that can currently operate it and it becomes to all the effect, not an open access fishery. And so there are some discussion also inevitably about the social implication and the right to fish that other people uh, might want to claim at some point. And so this also has to be taken into account. Uh, more discussion about individual transferable quotas are reported in a seminal paper by Chris Costello, Steve Gaines, and Joel Lehman, can catch share prevent fishery collapse. Let's briefly talk about another approach to try to maximize ill without encountering the same problem that we've seen before, which is custom effort fishing policy. We've seen these graphs already, these figures. Here we have a stock recruitment relationship. This is the basically the relationship that represents the it's proportional to um, the uh, catch per unit time and uh, e is the effort and we've seen that we can increase the effort and by doing so you know individually we can start to increase the catch from the yield from i1 to i2 to i3 and we've increased the effort even more we can you know the catch will be i4 we can report the catch as a functioning factor of e1 e2 e3 e4 as represented here and we see that if we exceed the effort uh, above E3, the catch, the yield will actually decrease, which is a, one of the typical feature of exploitation of renewable resources. Um, now, when uh, we uh, look at that, it's obvious that there is a level of effort that allows to achieve the maximum yield. Okay, and uh, this is basically the idea of exploiting the resources with maximum, um, you know, that providing the maximum sustainable yield. If we increase the effort even further for any error, um, then basically the catch adjusts automatically as long as we do not exceed the slope here, there is always chance of recovery of the population once we bring the catch back, the effort back to EMSY. Okay. This is true for this nicely shaped stock recruitment function. The reality we know is very different. There is a lot of background noise and stock recruitment relationship are always fragile. And in addition to that, we have seen that they can also be characterized by uh, the uh, critical dependency that is the LE effect. And uh, there is an inflection point in the stock recruitment relationship. In this case, if we increase the effort, 
At the beginning, we can see we got the catch here and the catch there, but if we increase the effort above a certain threshold, as you can see, we're gonna have again free uh, equilibria of which uh, at this point, the one for the larger level of stock is uh, uh, stable. Uh, the origin become actually a stable equilibrium itself and here we're gonna get an unstable equilibrium point. And uh, uh, so if for the vagaries of the weather, we drop down to that point, the population will start to decrease and goes to the extinction. And uh, so we say it's stable, unstable, and stable. And uh, if we maximize to match the effort and we exceed even that to guarantee the maximum sustainable yield, this unstable and stable equilibrium, we, equilibrium will collapse among each other and then disappear. And basically the local extinction of the stock is gonna be the only uh, potential solution. Um, we can represent this uh, by reporting the yield here on this graph as a function of effort, very similarly to what we did before. And what you can see, we can increase the effort to the point that allow to achieve the maximum sustainable yield. But if for any case uh, we exceed that effort, the, at some point the stable equilibrium collapses with the stable one, in what is called uh, um, settled not bifurcations, and we're going to get a catastrophic transition that lead to the local extinction of the stock. In that case, if that happen to allow for the stock to recover, we need to reduce the fishing effort much below the level that cause E4 that cause uh, the collapse of the species. If we have a, so we have this catastrophic transition, if we have a critical depensation so for which the stock recruitment relationship is by its own nature without even the fishing mortality characterized uh, by um, an unstable uh, equilibrium for lower density below which there is reproductive in success and so the population is local to extinction, this event is even stronger. And once the population is trapped, in this basin of attraction, it won't be unable to recover any longer at that point. We have seen that this type of critical deposition sometimes might be caused, for instance, by predators that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, forage on a really diversified diet. And because of that, they might cause this critical depensation to arise.